This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. We're going to be going back to Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. God's been dealing with me about some things, dealing with chaos, the Holy Spirit, and the remnant. And as some of this stuff was brewing in my spirit, I haven't got a chance to hear Derek Gilbert's presentation down at True Legends. I do have the DVDs ordered. But I heard snippets that kind of validate what I was kind of feeling in my spirit that the chaos that we see in Genesis 2 is actually a spirit. And then in his presentation, he traced it all throughout the Word of God and at the very end of the book of Revelation. It's one of the last spirits to be put underfoot. And with everything that's going on in the world today, we need to understand this dynamic and how that we are the antithesis to chaos. So I want to start in verse 1. This is very familiar. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Period. There's a period there. Now one of the things I taught in my True Legends conference session is how that there was a war when Lucifer fell between verses 1 and 2. This is also echoed by Isaiah where he talks about this happening and there's no humans left to be found or whatever the life forms were at that time. I think they were angelic hosts. There is evidence that planet Earth, Mars, and then a planet on the other side of Mars, which used to be called Rahab, all were good whole life. In fact, the prophets tell us that Almighty God in this rebellion shattered Rahab and wounded the dragon. Well, Rahab, the planet, if it was shattered, there is literally an asteroid belt in our solar system on the other side of Mars that if you put it all together, you would have a planet. In fact, many of the asteroids and meteorites uh, that we fear hitting planet Earth that are caught in the gravitational pull of the sun all stem from Rahab. And I found one of the things that was interesting, uh, Tom Horn in his book on Wormwood, dealing with uh, what NASA is hiding from us, that there's going to be one, there's one of those large asteroids that are going to kind of come, and when it actually gets nearer to the Earth, it's literally going to look like a dragon snaking through the sky as it heads for planet Earth. That was very possibly where Lucifer's original throne was. It was his planet. And so we see, because, I mean, no, God, in, in fact, the prophet even said, because in, in, the, in the wording here, it's, it's the, earth, the earth became to, tohu. The prophets, I, I think it was uh, Jeremiah said, God did not create the earth to be tahu. He did. How many know God is not the author of confusion? When God makes stuff, stuff is good, okay? It's not decimated. And so this is not just, when you go past this, 
during the seven days of creation, it is not the, the primordial process of God creating the earth. It's God terraforming and restoring the earth. Now, your old commentaries, you're not going to find the word terraforming. That is a new scientific concept that we're actually planning if we ever go out in space that we could actually take a planet like Mars and terraform it to do things to restore the atmosphere. Because when Rahab shattered, it collided into Mars and tore a good portion of its atmosphere away, and it also decimated planet Earth. In the New King James, it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, period. Okay, thought. This happened, and then it adds, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So you have decimation, period, and then you have the Spirit of God responding to hover over. Now, when you start looking at all the junk that's going on, the chaos, guys, the, the, the God of communism, the God of the Illuminati, the God of Freemasonry is chaos. They, are, they systematically try to loose chaos so that they can establish another order. But one of the things that we have seen throughout history and that we see prophetically is one of these days chaos is going to get out of the box and they're not going to be able to control it. How I many of that's going to be bad for planet earth? Because chaos wants to bring planet earth right back to what we see in Genesis 1 and 2. Now I'd begin to dig a little deeper in this. I love dig digging in the Hebrew but I also wanted to look at some exegetical commentaries to see, to examine the Hebrew here. And this is out of the Critical and Exegetical Commentary on Genesis, the International Critical Commentary. And this is a description of chaos. It is perhaps impossible to unite the figures of the description in a single picture, but the constitutive elements of the notion of chaos appears to be confusion, darkness, and water. The weird effects of the language is very impressive. So the language in the Hebrew is not normal Hebrew. Okay? On the syntax, the meaning of, the exact meaning of this uh, alliterative phrase, tohu we bahu, is difficult to make out. So this is a top Hebraist on the planet looking at this and saying, what? Literally, I'm, I'm being honest here. The connotation of tohu ranges from uh, the concrete desert to the abstract non-entity, while bohu possibly means emptiness. And then he goes on to confess the exegetical tendency has been to emphasize the latter aspect and approximate to the Greek notion of chaos as empty space. So we don't have a clue what the Hebrew is saying here, so we went to the Greeks to find out. And everybody said, what? Okay. So I got that. Okay, I want to dig just a little bit deeper. This is the book of Genesis, chapters 1 through 7, the New International Commentary on the Old Testament. The first issue is the understanding of the two words tohu we bahu. It is unusual but not heard of to have two juxtaposed words in Hebrew that rhyme. Tohu bohu. It's like, almost like it was poetry. Uh, rhyming could indicate, along with other factors, that this verse was poetry rather than, than poise. It is less likely that the phrase is understood as Farego, which is uh, an expression made up of meaningless words whose meaning may be determined from context. No sure Semitic conjugate for bohu has yet been discovered. So it's like, we don't know what bohu means. But tohu is safely equated to uh, agar, the thwa, meaning desert. Now, both the words are nouns, and thus we have translated them as desert and waste place. The rendering without form and void authorized version might give the impression that these words are adjectives. 
which an adjective describes what a noun is. It gives meaning to noun. And although it, it's translated that way, it's not. Okay. Then they at least start thinking Hebraically, but yet on the other hand, <laughs> yet on the other hand, the second word, bohu, appears only three times in the Old Testament and always in conjunction with tohu. Now, tohu can appear by itself throughout the Hebrew text, but there's only three places in all the Word of God that you find bohu, and it's always twinned with tohu. Kind of like the brothers. Okay? And then he references Isaiah 34, 11, and this is the line from Isaiah, that, from their translation, that the line of confusion tohu and the plummet of chaos bohu. And the only other time it's found is in Jeremiah 4.23, where he says, The earth, and lo, it was waste, tohu, and void, bohu, uh, bohu, 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 which is, which is Isaiah prof actually looking at what was occurring in Genesis 1-2. Okay? So, tohu and bohu, confusion and chaos, are nouns, yet they are used in a sentence structure as if they're adjectives. Have I got you confused yet? Absolutely. I got a, we got an email this morning that said, Dr. Lake said the Nekesh wasn't in the garden until after the eve sinned, and I'm confused. I'm saying, I said, what? No. Can it be, and this is one of the things that I'm postulating, can it be this like the Nehesh in the garden, that serpent? That was not the original meaning of, of Nehesh. It was the name of the seraph, the dragon that came into the garden, very possibly the very one that God wounded when he destroyed Rahab, came into the garden and tempted Adam and Eve. And he lost his arms and legs, and I believe that was a literal judgment, because in China, where you see within their mythology the appearance of seraphim, they all got arms and legs, you go into Mesoamerica, and Quetzalcoatl or Merakuru, or whatever you want to call the guy, the dude has to ride a silver disc because he has no arms and legs. Kind of makes you go, hmm. And when you look at the historical etymology this, the word that was the name of this dragon became associated with serpent. So can it be in the beginning as God is revealing to us the conflict that no one would actually really understand until we got into the writing of the prophets dealing with the fall of Lucifer and dealing with these dark angels that fell, that as God judged Rahab and destroyed what was going on on Mars... And you say, why is that even significant? Anybody hear of, a, of a, an occultist named Aliester Crowley? In his book of the law, there is a verse that deals with a gleaming treasure that awaits mankind on Mars. Maybe of the ancient civilization of what we know as the watchers waiting to be discovered. Maybe that's the reason that curiosity and discovery and all those other little rovers, maybe they're roving for more than just dirt and rocks. Kind of makes a boy wonder, doesn't it? But we see that confusion and chaos is loosed. And it tried to take over the earth. And so when we're dealing with confusion, confusion, then chaos. In 1 Corinthians 14, 33, I want to show you something. You know, a lot of times in the, in the Word of God, when Jesus would cast out a demon, it would have a name. And those names expressed its nature. Just like we can talk about Lilith and all that goes on with it, or Jezebel. And that spirit that empowered Jezebel, that wasn't its original name. We associate it with Jezebel because it's the most prominent figure in the Word of God that that spirit functioned through, that had maintained. We even find Jezebel listed in the book of Revelation, somebody flowing in that same spirit. So these names can be an expression of its nature manifesting. 
And God proclaims that God is not the author of confusion. Which meant that spirit may have been an angel of order that when it fell, the iniquity force warped it to become the opposite, the antithesis, disorder, confusion. That does not come from God. But what, what is God? God is the author of peace in all the churches of the saints. And so guys, if you have anything but peace going on in your congregation, you have another spirit loosed. And in the hierarchy, I think that when, when you look at it, I get, I get this in the book, it's getting ready to come out. You have principalities and you have powers, and there's a structure there that they're regional. When you get into the rulers of darkness, there is no region. You can actually use that one for Lucifer, but it's his agents that are global. It's, and so they're actually, in a sense, they're, they're, they're more powerful than principalities because they're not restricted to a geographical location, and they can set up shop anywhere. And I believe that chaos and confusion are global entities that look for places to manifest. And so, how I many know in the Greek culture, in the pagan culture, they understood chaos, and with many of their gods, that chaos was welcomed. But the Apostle Paul was saying, listen, God is not the author of, of confusion, and it's not welcome in the church because where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty, and where Jesus rules and reigns, the Prince of Peace brings the shalom of the kingdom with him. Now let's go on to James 3, because one of the things that James reveals is that from confusion and chaos, they present themselves with a secular, pagan, dark wisdom. It's the wisdom of the mystery religions. It's the wisdom of communism. It's the wisdom of the Illuminati. It's the wisdom of Antifa. It's the wisdom of whatever other movement that you want to call it. And we need to understand going on in America today... We have a lot of good people that are African-American that are protesting because of what the prejudice that have been done, rightfully so, and they are all peaceful. But these, these anarchists are trying to usurp, take over, looking, as this is a distraction, they're burning down everything. The ones over here, their, God is conf their gods are confusion and chaos. And those things we need to start praying against. But one of the things that breaks my heart is when you see the black community raise up with a righteous, should be a righteous indignation. You see these people basically destroying the protest. They're destroying the, the businesses of black owners. And what really gets my goat is why are all the movie stars raising funds to get the looters out of jail, but nobody's rebuilding these businesses of these precious people. That's showing the hypocrites that they are. Because they serve another God. Starting at verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts and, do not, and uh, do not boast and lie against the truth, the wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and what? Demonic. Okay, demonic. For where envying and self-seeking exists, I'm reading from the New King James, envying and self-seeking I want you to underline those in your Bible. Do you know why that's so powerful? It's describing the fall of Lucifer. He was envious of the Creator's position. And the Antichrist spirit is the spirit of self. I will be like, I'm going to promote me, 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 me. That's what's behind this wisdom. And he goes on to say, listen, when envying and self-seeking are, right behind it comes confusion. 
And then what is the working of chaos? Every evil work. You can look at this and see Genesis 1-2 when you understand the Hebrew words. Lucifer fell because he wanted, to, he wanted to exalt himself. He was envious of God that caused confusion and chaos to be loosed in heaven. And James says, guys, don't do this. You're putting back the fall of Lucifer right back in the church. Don't move in that mystery religion wisdom. But thank God for verse 17, but there is a wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable that brings shalom, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Boy, wouldn't you like to see justice in America without partiality and hypocrisy? You know, to do that, we first of all got to get lawmakers that pass laws they don't indemnicate themselves from. If it's good enough for the goose, it's good enough for the gander, the old saying is. How dare they pass laws that they make themselves exempt from? Congress was set up so there would be no royal class. And I'll be darned if within less than 200 years, they began going that very track, didn't they? It started with the progressive movement at the beginning of the 20th century. The Constitution was supposed to be able to keep those guys under control. But you know what? You're not even taught the Constitution anymore in school. You're not taught it. And when you look at colleges that you have the constitutional expert, they're all progressives. That's like having a Buddhist teach on Christianity. Oh, <laughs> makes me mad. <laughs> but the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So whenever you start seeing a church where there's all this chaos, confusion, somebody let the devil in. And James says, don't do it. It'll destroy everything in its path. You say, oh, great. Where does that tell me we're headed? How many know there's another, another part of Genesis 1-2? Remember I said period, and then there was another statement? And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That is not just a footnote. You have confusion and chaos wanting to absolutely do to earth what God just did to Rahab and the Holy Spirit swooped down and said you're not doing that to put it in a modern vernacular the Holy Spirit became a containment field to limit chaos and confusion waiting for Almighty God to begin giving commandments Every one of the six day creations, except for the making of man, God issued a commandment. In the Hebrew, it is a commandment. How I many know it wasn't a request, it was not a suggestion? The Creator was giving, and so within the commandments of God, there is a creative force. I tell you what, if we got just half of what that meant on the way home, we'd have a hard time staying on the road. It is a creative force that undoes what confusion and chaos tries to establish. The Holy Spirit was restraining the damage accomplished by confusion and chaos and would not allow it to go beyond a point in which the command of God could not restore. Woo! Woo! That's probably one of the reasons why when you got saved, you got the Holy Ghost. One of his jobs is to hover over you to make sure confusion and chaos will not take you past the point of no return. 
I'm about to have a Holy Ghost fit. I'm starting to get Pentecostal up here. Guys, throughout church history, confusion and chaos rose up to devastate as much of humanity as possible. One of the things that turned the tides, of, there was something called the Dark Ages. How many know they're dark? <laughs> That's one of the reasons they're called the bad. Now the Middle Ages wasn't a much better. You know, it, it, it was at least going, it went from pitch black to dark gray, okay? I look and I thank God I didn't live back then. You know, if we lived back then, our ministry would have been over at 32 because that's the average. Unless you were royal, that's how long you lived. But you know what turned the tide when you look historically? If you could line it out in a time chart, it was something called the Reformation. God got out of the Catholic box that the mystery religions had formed for it in the Catholic Church. The light of God began to flow. People started getting born again. So much so that even the threat of being burned at the stake would not get them to renounce Jesus. And so can you imagine, especially with the control that the Catholic Church had then, do you know there's a great possibility that when Martin Luther had his epiphany and got saved, he may have been, maybe except for a few Anabaptists that were in the mountains, may have been one of the few saved on the planet. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit was reduced to a few while the whole world was moving in confusion and chaos. But as the Protestant movement began to grow, and guys, we need to understand the preciousness of this Bible. Men and women died, millions of them, in the wars of the Reformation, just so that you could have the right to hold this in your hands and read it in your own country's language. And it was so precious before the Gutenberg Press, the Gutenberg Press, that the few that could be produced of the King James Bible, they had steel backs. Now they're about this big, and they had a steel back and a steel chain. It was chained to the altar of the church, and people would stand in line for days just to be able to read 10 minutes from the Word of God in their own language. This right here is one of the most precious possessions on planet Earth. Now the weird thing about it, it's printed in China, but there's no problem because Chinese don't speak English. So to them it just says, man, ba bam ba bam 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 as far as they're concerned. But there's a video that brings me to tears every single time. And it's a suitcase of Bibles brought it smuggled into China where the Word of God is a rare thing. And these people are kissing the Word of God and they're wiping their tears off the covers of it and they're holding it to themselves because it is so precious. And we in America and Laodicea, well, it's just I can believe it if I want it. And I, I don't know, I just don't care. I just don't have time. We ought to feel conviction about that. When you understood the sacrifice of previous generations, and regardless of what the media tells you today, the first book published by the United States Congress was a Bible. Because they knew that a republic that was not built upon a people knowing the Word of God could not exist and remain. In fact, one of the things George Washington said is, here's a republic, hope you can keep it. When was the last time on the news that you heard this, our country referred to as a, as a republic? We are not a democracy. 
A pure democracy is mob rules. You're kind of seeing that today in Seattle. You're seeing that today in Washington, D.C. And they keep on saying, and they, and they even chant, this is what democracy looks like. Well, good, take it over to a country that has it. We do not have democracy. We are a republic. <sighs> yeah, I'm getting on my soapbox. It's okay. Here lately in my prayer closet, I've done a lot of weeping for America, especially with whatever happened last week. It's like the weekend. I don't know if it was, but Mary, Mary felt the same thing. It's like, she said, you know, I felt like somebody just crossed the line. And I'm thinking, okay, you're, you properly articulated what I couldn't and what I was feeling. There's been a line crossed. And I think it's the elite that have crossed it. And God is saying, you know what, you, you're like the Amorites, your, your cup of iniquity is about full and I'm getting ready to take care of a few things. That's why understanding the dynamic of the Holy Spirit being the restrainer is so important. It restrains chaos and confusion. What did the Apostle Paul say that we are? We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. So if you were going to find the Holy Spirit anywhere, where would you find him? We have become too church building oriented. Do you know the church thrived for almost 200 and some odd years, almost 250 years before they ever had a building? Bread like cockroaches, the harder they tried. And, and guys... When you read the book of Acts and even, even, even the history that happened after that, every believer basically was living with the sword of Damocles, if you will, over their head that they could, they could give their lives at any moment because they were a believer. Yet in the threat of dying for your faith, people ran to to embrace Christianity. kind of makes me wonder if we're preaching the same gospel that they preached back then. Strong leaders. Oh, how we need strong leaders. One thing I've been praying for me is fill me up with courage. Fill me up with courage, the courage of a warrior in the kingdom of God. I want to be a good soldier just like the Apostle Paul admonished Timothy to be. And all my bullets are for the devil, spiritually speaking. Let me hit every round on target. Let me show no mercy to the devil, but be used of God to set the captive free. Now in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, how many know Everybody was there, got baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, or shortly thereafter. So they were all filled with the Spirit. And you have the leadership that was taken, beaten, and threatened, say, don't ever heal in the name of Jesus again. And they prayed just the opposite, give us boldness that week that you would stretch forth the, the arm of your holy child, Jesus, and just start healing people all over the place. And not only was the place shaken, but the Spirit-filled believers were infilled again. A little dab of the Holy Spirit won't do you. And what we have today in the church is we use less of the Holy Spirit than some people use brill cream. Just a little dab will do you. This is what Finest Dake says on, on this in these verses. And they are all filled with the Holy Spirit and spake the word of God with boldness. 
Believers who are baptized in the Spirit must have new outpourings of the Spirit to maintain the fullness of God. Christ himself lived in prayer and received many infillings and fresh supplies of the Spirit and power to continue in all the fullness of God. As virtue went out of him, it had to be supplied again as proved by the scriptures above. And he lists all these different scriptures. And by the many times that Christ prayed as men must do to maintain spiritual power in life. Even Baptist Schofield in the Schofield Reference Bible referring to Acts 1 and 8 says there's one baptism yet many infillings. Now in my, in my second book I deal with how that the iniquity force is the power source for the kingdom of darkness. The Holy Spirit, and I'm not reducing him to a force, but how much he can flow in your life. But he is the power source for the kingdom. He empowers the kingdom. God will not allow anything to power his kingdom but himself. When Adam was created in the garden, his very first breath was the Holy Spirit that caused that lump of clay to become a sentient being, a living soul in the hands of God. And is it any accident that the resurrected Christ, when he appeared to his disciples, he breathes on them and says, receive you the Holy Spirit. Because he knew they had a battle. I'm really tempted. I've got to do a session here in the next couple of weeks. I've got to send for uh, Go Ye Therefore Conference, and I'm wanting to entitle it, Buck Up, Buttercup, You're in the Army Now. What do we do to fill up the tank? The Holy Spirit is the power source of every believer. And here is our paradox, if you will, in where we're living. The Holy Spirit within us, His filling must be at a greater level than the confusion and chaos around us. That's why the church has been attacked for over 100 years in America and our seminaries have been contaminated and there have been perverted versions of the Word of God brought forth and there have been denominations that were once on fire for God that serve Baal and do not serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. They have the name on the outside, but if you could see in the Spirit, it says Ichabod across the doorposts. And it was on purpose... Because we're the salt. We're the light in the earth. And we're playing church. Instead of being a force of God to suppress confusion and chaos. In fact, I've, uh, in, my, in my historicity, if you will, let me use a Tom Horn word, in my own history, I have seen too many churches and too many people in churches move more by confusion and chaos than they were by the Holy Spirit. It's manifested in drama. Not God. Guys, we're getting ready to enter into a time that if you try that where God is trying to establish the remnant, you will be judged by God on the spot. In fact, one of the ways that we can stay filled with the Spirit, the Apostle Paul says we're supposed to, to speak to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Spiritual songs. Now let me ask you something. If the Christian music that you're not listening to does not increase the Holy Spirit within you, it's not kingdom songs. If it puffs up self, if it pampers the flesh, 
If it's just a warm fuzzy, but the Holy Spirit within you is not being refilled. Because every time that God uses us as salt in life, a portion of himself has to flow with that so that he can restrain chaos and confusion to bring healing, to bring restoration, to bring whatever. And so my job when I do it as a priest is I'm continually doing service in the temple, whether it's the outer court, the inner court, or the Holy of Holies. It's all about establishing the fire of God in all three places so that the Spirit of God can fill those places. (coughs) Peter knew about this to the point that there was a containment field of the Holy Spirit around him that if you could get close enough to interact with his shadow... That sickness and disease left. He didn't even have to pray. He had the Holy Ghost running out his ears. The Apostle Paul, they could put aprons on him, not Masonic aprons. I'm not going to use the word I was going for. They're trying to say, there, there are people out there trying to say that the Apostle Paul was a Mason. And how many know that is the biggest pile of horse manure that has ever been produced on planet earth. They could take cloth because cloth can hold the anointing. It's made of earth. It's natural. And so the the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit would flow out of the Apostle Paul, go into that cloth, and they could just simply lay that cloth on those that were demon-possessed or those that were sick, and it drove out confusion and chaos. The task for the believer in this day, for the remnant, is to be so filled with the Holy Ghost that when you enter a room, chaos and confusion have got to leave. Oh. Go into a 7-Eleven and there's kids over there thinking about stealing some candy. And then Officer Smith walks in. How many know the candy stealing just stopped? Little beads of sweat begin to break out on Johnny and Jimmy's heads and hope he didn't realize what we were doing because he's going to take me home to mom and then the whoopings start. I'm talking about when real parroting used to actually happen in America. Part of what we're seeing on the streets today is when you teach, your, when you teach parents it's illegal to whip children so they don't realize there are consequences for sin. And you hand out participation trophies. How's that working for America today? When we go into places, our job during the week, well, I'm going to get that at church. You're not going to ever get it at church. If you're too lazy during the week to get it, an hour and a half on the weekend... Isn't going to do it. I'm here to give you your vitamins. The average pastor is here to give you your vitamins. To take you a little deeper than you should have been able to go yourself. But you know what sets a pastor free? What sets a teacher of the word free? Is when you have been studying all week. And you have been praying all week. And you come in filled with the word. And you come in filled with the spirit of God. Then he can take it to another level. One of the reasons that pastors week after week after week have to give out milk is because the saints aren't even drinking their milk during the week. And if he'd take them out of kindergarten, they'd choke to death on it. I, I've trained aspirants for, of the ministry for almost 40 years. I go at conferences and I talk to the conference speakers. They long to go deeper. And let me tell you something. There's there's some that that I fellowship with that could get so deep you need a snorkel. And it is good stuff. But God won't release them to do it. You know why? 
Your level of word didn't pass kindergarten. Your level of the word is so minute in your life. The level of the Holy Spirit is so minute in life because we do all the praising and the worshiping at church. I'm preaching to myself because one of the things that I have found, you know, part of, I need, I'm, I'm working toward my next point, okay? For those in ministry and some of us old guard, we're wore out. And to be honest, we're out and fed up. And so you concentrate on things that you can do, and in all the, the stuff that's just a constant irritant, you have to get to the place where you don't care just to survive, and God's getting ready to change a lot of that. And so you kind of tune it out. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, this is talking about the last days and the Antichrist. And how many know the... Doc Marquis revealed this. He said that before the Son of Perdition could be revealed, it's the task of the Illuminati to get to the planet to the place where it's already the stage is already set. The Antichrist doesn't bring the, the world to the place where he can be put on the stage. It's their job to get us wore out. It's their job to get us away from the Word. It's their, their job to suppress the church. It's their job to get our tanks empty so that he can come on the stage. Okay? It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and thank to change times and laws, and they are given into his hand unto a time and a times and a dividing of times. This word wear out in the Aramaic, because this part of Daniel is written in Aramaic and not Hebrew, is Belah, which means to wear away, to wear out, and to harass constantly. That harass constantly, if there was ever a definition of social media today, maybe that's it. The whole concept of Facebook. You know, we got, how long do you spend on Facebook, Mike? Just long enough to say, hey, we got something new. But I'm not arguing with anybody. And you know, just common decency. I watch, a, I watch a lot of different guys on YouTube. You know, the old thing, if you don't have anything good to say, just don't say anything. Because let me tell you something. Everybody wants to gripe about stuff. Somebody takes the time to make a video, do the research, try to present it, and they're halfway trying to serve God. How about encouraging them to go deeper instead of ripping them apart and the infamous thumbs down? Mary and I can come off a podcast, and I mean, it's just like, oh man, the Holy Spirit was really speaking today, and Bert and Ernie and Big Bird showed up. Every, I, we can have 500 thumbs up, but it's always the same three, dot, three thumbs down. Why do you mess with even listening to us if you don't agree with anything that we say? It's self. I get to have my say. I didn't like this. I didn't like this. I didn't like this. I didn't like this. Same, same thing goes on in churches. Pastor, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need to do this. Now, I don't have a clue what you're really doing or the vision, but you know what? You don't have the vision. We hired you. We elected you. And so you're going to do our vision. But the congregation is as schizophrenic as can be. I remember years ago, I was pastoring a church that, that I didn't start. And that, those are the ones where Mary got migraines every single weekend because when I get in the pulpit, I don't care. It's what saith the Lord. You had half the church afraid of getting the baptism. We don't want to be Pentecostal. And the other half of the church had been fasting and praying for years to get the Holy Ghost. And all of them watched the clock to make sure that I didn't go over noon. How many know that uh, I did not really do well in that environment? And they'll probably tell you to this day that they tolerated my pastoralship there because even when they have the homecomings, I have yet to be invited. They probably marked that as the, the black dark years of the congregation. <laughs> not that Mike Lake didn't have problems, he did. But I tried my best to deliver the word. I just wasn't a hand holder and a head patter. 
How many know that I'm still kind of that way? If you're wanting somebody here to pat your head and, and to hold your hand, I'm not it. You want to find out what the Word says, I'll tell you what the Word says. And a lot of it is not head patting and hand holding. A lot of times it's butt whooping. <laughs> Come on. It's the hand that's just applied to a different portion of the body. Guys, we, are, we have been in an extended season in which the saints have been persecuted on, on the outside and continually being harassed to the point of wear away and to be wear out on the inside by those in bondage and goats in the pasture. I want to say for a lot of those that listen to us, I'm not talking about those that have had mind control programming. You can set that aside. It takes a lot of years and it takes special ministry to do that. And some of it, if it's government level, with using advanced harmonics, unless God releases a supernatural power that we have yet seen, you can't undo it. Because it's scientific. They altered the brain. That's, that's a whole other can of whack, uh, worms over here that I'm believing that God one day is going to loose an anointing for for those that are specifically called of heaven to be warriors in that area. And I don't care if they altered DNA. I don't care if they used harmonics to seal things up that can never be unsealed. My Bible says they're, they're, I serve a God who can open doors when nobody else could. And when he shuts doors, ain't no programming, no harmonics, no, no surveillance system, no Anything that they can do from satellites can open doors that he has closed. Now, I'll be, I got it. I'm a teacher of the word. But I tell you what, when I see some people that are moving in that, that are true to God, they're going to get financial backing. They're going to get prayer support from this ministry. And I'm, I'm going to be waving the flag, go baby, go. Because it's needed. I'm not, so I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the carnal believer that has barely one foot in the kingdom while he's dangling the rest of himself in the world and he is preventing or she is preventing what God wants to do in the church. They're being used of Satan to wear out those I remember when, when, when God set Mary free. Wondrous thing. I mean, she woke up one morning, colors look different. I look good looking. It was a miracle. And instead of rejoicing, the ones that piled on her like she was a quarterback with a football were the saints. And a good part of it was your freedom's making us look bad. I tell you what, if I go back, I mean, you know, you always feel like, boy, if I go back and do something different, if I go back and do something different, I'd have grabbed my family and I'd have run. We'd have been out of there quicker than, than Ricochet Rabbit. The problem is finding a church that doesn't have that going on. Bigger churches. You will have a core of remnant that have to surround that minister to protect them. And people griping, well, it takes 19 different levels to get to speak to the pastor. Yeah, so that you don't kill him. Come on now. It's, it's just the truth. Because it's like today we should have turned the air conditioner on before we got here a little bit better. I was afraid it was going to storm last night, so it didn't turn out. It's hot in here. In a traditional church, you'll have 50 people lining up telling the pastor, you know, I really couldn't understand and, and listen to the sermon because it was too hot in here. Then you always have the other side, no, it was too cold in here. Then the other side, you went too long. Then another side, you didn't go long enough. And on the other side, how come you're always going back to Genesis 1? I think we have it down now. You ain't got it down. We all don't have it down yet. There's still secrets being revealed. How about... That at least we weren't in a hut in Africa holding church believing that the Muslim marauders would not hunt us down and kill us while we were having church. Griping only goes on in Laodicea. 
bunch of spoiled brats. I'm speaking to myself this morning. I'm a spoiled brat and I'm trying to get over it. Somebody pray for me. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. In America, we're spoiled. We're, we turned on the news this morning and, and they had a little segment of defectors that got out of North Korea and into South Korea. And this one defector, after he got out, they, they took him to a buffet. So you have, you know what, a, I mean, a Korean buffet is this, a oriental version of an American buffet. Food galore. That guy stood spellbound and so overwhelmed by not only the plenty of food, but the variety of food, it so numbed him that he went and got a little bit of rice, plain, and sat down and ate it because it was so overwhelming just to have food. We get mad if they didn't get that hot fried chicken up there quick enough. That pan was empty for 30 seconds, and it was that 30 seconds that I was in line. <sighs> Things have got to change. And I'll tell you the meanest bunch, if you ever talked to anybody that ever serves in the food industry, the meanest bunch are the Sunday crowd after they come out of church. They had not had a testimony. It ought to be, thank you for serving on Sunday and putting up with all these people. But here's an extra tip. And don't you ever, ever give what looks like a $20 bill and leave it down there and it's a track without wrapping 100 around it. Because they're getting pennies on the dollar to be there. All their wages come from tips. The stuff that we do. And the Holy Spirit isn't in any of it. Why should the Holy Spirit refill us if we're not going to be used correctly in the earth? Oh. I, I'm messing today. As I was putting this together yesterday, God messed me all up, and so I'm here just sharing the, sharing the messing. The truth and the solution. And this is for those of us in ministry. God never called us to be in ministry 24-7. You know, like it's... Did you ever notice, even though they have news cycles 24-7, it's not the same newscaster. They work in four-hour shifts. But we, we tend... We think that we have got to be online with God, full of power, 24-7 to answer every question. Guys, I need two of me just to answer the emails. And my, my problem is, and are you guys familiar with email programs like you can flag one? And so I flagged one at 8.30 in the morning. And so at 10 o'clock in the morning, I went to show it to Mary, and I had to scroll down two or three hundred emails. So it's like, okay, it's like a stream that is constantly moving, and you throw a leaf in that stream. Every once in a while, I'll forget. I'll, I'll be scrolling through, you know, you scroll through, and you scroll through, and you scroll through, and you scroll through. Two hours later, you scroll through, and you scroll through. Oh, there was an email I meant to answer six weeks ago. We can't constantly be that way if we're in ministry. Jesus constantly took his disciples aside. And they were refilled by fellowshipping with him and in their own prayer lives. You read that, and they'd be looking for Jesus. Where is he? He's way out in the wilderness someplace praying where there ain't nobody. You know, it's like Jesus said, a country boy can't survive. You know? <laughs> I'm getting out of the city for a while. But he, he, he set the pattern for us. How many know Jesus could have ministered 24-7? He set the pattern for us. Because what the devil wants to do is wear you out to the place where you no longer care. I used to have a passion about those that wanted to learn. 
I got one this morning from a woman in South Africa. And you could tell she had a passion to learn. Didn't really need to enroll with the seminary, which we're not taking any enrollments right now anyway. Told her about eSword. Told her about BibleSupport.com so she can build a library most ministers would just give their eye teeth to have. You can actually get all that for free if you have a Windows computer. And then on top of that, God, the Holy Spirit said, send her covenant faith free. It just tickled me pink because you know why? Even though it was just a few words and it was a very nice email, you could hear the Spirit of God crying out, she's hungering for the Word. I will do backflips for somebody that's hungering for the Word. But what I get most of the time are people wanting to argue about the Word. Did you know that less than 10% of the posts that people try to post a KIB site, I can approve? Some of them are so vulgar that even WordPress flags them before they get to me. That's why I've had to turn off the comments on YouTube and everything else. We have got to set time aside to rest. But here's the tendency in Laodicea in America to rest. It's the purpose of Netflix. Where you can binge watch. At least there are no church folk in the shows. And the good guy gets to blow things up when they get to be a problem. It's kind of, you know, kind of therapeutic sometimes it feels like. Come on now. I remember years ago I had some things going on and I went and I was skeet shooting with a friend of mine. I went down to the skeet house and I took out a sharpie and I started writing some names and some situation on some skeet. Guy down, he said, boy, I would, I would want you to be my pastor. <laughs> he, said, he said, it's funny. He said, the only ones he ever missed were the ones that didn't have any names on it. <laughs> we got to unplug, but don't look to the world to unplug. We got to separate our walk from God with the ministry. And it's so easy for them to be, get amalgamated so that when you want to step away from ministry, you're stepping away from God. It's the way of Laodicea. Instead, he's got to become my refuge. I turn it all off so I have, I have full access to plug completely into him to fill up and to recharge. We have lost the art of just fellowshipping with the Creator and to seeking being filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is another problem for those in ministry. When you pick up the Bible, don't look for sermons that preach. We convert everything to sermons, and it doesn't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Just to feed us. You know, if you have a cook in the kitchen, and they can never eat what they prepare, but they're constantly preparing food for you, eventually they're going to fall over dead because they starve to death. And I think we have basically done that with a lot of church in America. We need to change the modality of how we do church. It's got to return back to the Word of God, and I'm going to end with this. And this one will literally be the thud heard around the world. Deacons are not leadership positions in the church. A deacon is a table waiter and a widow visitor. And if deacons are doing anything more than that to take the load off the pastor, do not call them deacons because they are not, and they are not biblical. We got to return back to the Word. The way that America does church is killing the church. It's killing those in ministry, and it's got to stop. It is confusion and chaos that has expressed itself in a theology that cannot be maintained in the church. It's time for us to rethink everything, and it's time for us to seek ways on how each one of us can refill ourselves during the week with the Holy Spirit. 
I went in the office this morning and I put on, and I woke up with it my spirit. Mary, I'll tell you, I was he's more than enough. You know, I, it, I have to have tune to be able to get it right. I can't sing like Gary Oliver, bless his heart. I was trying. Dogs were howling. Get over here this morning. Pulled out my iPhone. I'm going to listen to some Gary Oliver. And I was kind of doing this when I was printing out song sheets and different things. Why? It fills the tank. It's scriptural. It's biblical. It's centered on God. When we do that, we fill ourselves up. You got a cell phone that's a smartphone. Is it smart enough to have the Word of God and audio on it? If it is, you ought to be smart enough to hit play. Because sometimes hearing it, you will hear different things than reading it. In fact, Rabbi Eric Walker listens to it as he reads it. Whether he's doing it in Hebrew or in English. Because it activates both sides of his brain and the Holy Spirit can spend more time talking to him. We've got to find those things and we've got to begin doing it. The days of he- that are ahead of us demand it. And if the church will rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit, officers can't do it, military can't do it. The church is the one who is supposed to suppress chaos and confusion with a Holy Spirit that is in us. And that is the job of the remnant. It's time for us to, to raise up as a people, cry out for God to spot judge, and then to fill us to the brim, to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. How long is that going to take? How empty are you? We're not talking about microwave. They tarried before the Lord. They didn't put them on a timer, you find out in the book of Acts. They tarried before the Lord. That needs to be the hallmark that this remnant member needs to rediscover and every remnant member needs to rediscover. Tearing before the Lord and fellowshipping to receive that fresh infilling for the day, for the week, for the month. So that no matter what situation we go, our tank is full. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would just give us a determination to be filled with your spirit overflowing. Father, let us take everything out of our lives that hinders that, that becomes an obstacle or a replacement, a pseudo false thing that the world gives us to placate the desire to be filled with you. And let your remnant, let, let it not just fill them, but let it flow like a river out of them, just like Jesus promised. Now, Father, we open ourselves up to you. Father, adjust whatever you need to adjust. Cause us to give up whatever we need to give up and replace it with the kingdom we ask. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant, and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. 
tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.